Great. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are very, very excited to have this first tech webinar series at We Robotics. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, if you're not familiar with We Robotics, uh, check our website, werobotics.org and uh, flyinglabs.org. We are a not-for-profit company. Uh, we um, basically localize technology around the world and part of our mandate or mission is to share um, knowledge. Uh, and so we are very excited today to have three presenters um, who are going to present some new and exciting ideas, technologies, um, um, and, and, and let them basically explain what, the, what these are about. So first, we will hear from Igor Vereninov, who is the co-founder and CEO of MLIB, a company developing and manufacturing RTK GNSS receivers. Prior to starting MLIB, Igor led the research and development team for leading UAV manufacturer. Um, so thank you very much, Igor, uh, and uh, let you uh, get started with your presentation. Yeah, um, I hope I have unmuted myself. Uh, perfect. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the intro. And uh, today I want to talk about, uh, about what we do, about our um, RTK receivers. And, uh, you know, I myself have um, very, uh, very long uh, kind of UV mapping experience. And um, I remember, like, the first time you make a, a map with a drone, you know, you're happy, you make a flight, you get a bunch of pictures, you stitch them together, and um, kind of you are happy. And then the question arises, you know, um, is my map accurate? And um, how can I make sure that this is not just uh, just a pretty picture or a pretty model of something, but it's actually meaningful, uh, accurate data? And um, like I assume that most of our audience has background in drone mapping, and just we we all know how important is accurate georeferencing of our models. And um, for example, what we observed is some of our customers as well making repeated flights day after day and then trying to create control lines or uh, digital elevation models. And then if you fly over the same territory every day, you know, you will see that your models, they, they, they do not really match one the other. And then with just nor when you're using normal GPS, um, these differences between models, they could be on the range of meters and even more on some kind of elongated uh, projects. Um, and ground control solves these issues, right? So it's, um, it's a way to pin your models, to make them accurate, to make them meaningful data. Um, what are like main approaches, how, how you go about, you know, establishing your ground control, pace, placing the ground control points, measuring them actually. And the first thing we usually do, you know, what's very natural is to hire a surveyor, hire a professional to do that. Um, other option is to kind of buy the equipment that the surveyor uses and teach yourself to, uh, to use it. And the option that we offer is to use uh, rich RTK receiver. And I'm gonna go in depth about these options, you know, what are the pros and cons. So the first option is to hire a surveyor and it's a really good option for a start. Um, the, uh, in some cases, this is mandatory and then, you know, there's, <laughs> there's basically no other option if you, if you are supposed to do that. Uh, for legal uh, reasons, but otherwise, the uh, kind of the disadvantage of working with the surveyor is that there is another like person that is usually not on your team. It's somebody you have to you know to to make arrangements with. Uh, it's additional costs, and it's also uh, you are just less flexible in what you do. You can't just you know go and do something. You have to have to actually make sure that this person is available. Uh, so the next you know, natural step is to buy the equipment that they use, but the problem is that the pricing is really steep. So it could be easily fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, and it kind of requires training. So it's it's not really intuitive and um, um, requires like additional equipment, data collectors. Um, it's not easy to figure out yourself. So the option is we offer is the RTK receiver that is 
easy to figure out yourself. It's, it's really easy to use because we offer mobile apps. So all the work that you do, all the measurements, you do them from your mobile phone. Uh, it's centimeter accurate, it's really accurate, and it's always at a really, it's actually at a really affordable price. So, uh, and that's kind of our thing. We, we, we are building RTK receivers that are, you know, that anyone can use and that will be affordable so that you can just, you know, use it as, an, as a, just as a tool. Um, now, one of the things that comes to, to, you know, to the mind that people maybe at first meet our company, go, hey, this can be true, like this data, you know, is it reliable? And over the years that we are building this, uh, we had numerous surveyors, surveying companies, uh, data processing companies, everyone wants to test and verify the accuracy. And they all got uh, pretty much the same results they will get with any other equipment. So it's, it's centimeter accuracy. Uh, here is an example of a survey done in, in uh, South Africa uh, where they checked the equipment on, uh, on the special calibration site and the results that they got were excellent. So we were under two centimeters on both axes, uh, which is more than enough for any kind of, virtually any kind of survey work. Uh, it has been also verified by, uh, by the good people of Drone Deploy. Uh, they actually started promoting the ground control point workflow and they also tested, uh, tested our equipment and verified it to work well. Um, so how does it actually work? Like the process of placing ground control points if you were to do it yourself and to, to measure them. <clears throat> Uh, now, what I'm going to be showing here is based on our uh, mobile app, which is available for iOS and Android. And uh, it allows you to configure the receivers and to actually do the survey, do stakeouts, and a lot of other things. Um, so the first step is obviously to just place the ground control, ground control points, the targets themselves, and uh, uh, now, there are many guides on how to properly do that, how to distribute them uh, in your model. Um, and I'm just not gonna go uh, deeply into that here, but uh, there are some rules how you do it. Uh, and you need to make sure that they are visible on your pictures in the end. Uh, for RTK GPS to work, uh, you need a base station, a reference station. And in many cases, these are available either from private services or from governments via Antrip, uh, but I assume that many uh, in our audience uh, might work in areas where there is no infrastructure, the really remote areas. Uh, so in that case, your own base is really, really convenient. Uh, and the base station is the same receiver, it's just a different mode of operation. Uh, once the base is set up, usually it's on a, on a PSM, if that is important, on a survey mark, or it could be just in, a, in any place and the base will determine its coordinate automatically. Um, connect the rover, uh, connect to it with the, with the mobile app and uh, create a project. So the app supports local coordinate systems, uh, geoidal models, grid shift models uh, for most of the countries there are. And um, so you can deliver the result in the, in the appropriate uh, coordinate system, and after that, just go and measure uh, measure those points. And uh, the the process itself is very straightforward. There is an app to measure, and then you can assign uh, some attributes to this point, give it a name, so that you can easily distinguish this particular ground control point in your files, uh, and set some rules for the required accuracy. Now, once you've measured all the points. Um, you can export those. And these are exported in a CSV format, which could be open with any kind of spreadsheet editing software if required, or uh, they can go uh, and be imported to, say, BigSweet or Photoscan uh, as ground control points. And that's pretty much it. So that is, uh, that is a very quick and efficient process. And I think that anyone can learn to do that. Uh, it's definitely less complicated than mapping, the, the actual mapping with a drone part. 
Uh, now, so this is just one workflow that is possible that is related to GCPs, but this product hasn't been actually created specifically for that. There is a lot of other things you can do. Um, so each unit can operate as a rover, as a base station. It could be used for post-processing. It could work as a base for, say, uh, Phantom 4 RGK or for any other RGK or PPK equipped drone. And we see a lot of projects where our customers learn to combine different modes of operation. So uh, just some examples. So what you can do is you can actually simultaneously use a base station for um, for a Phantom RTK uh, and use it as a base station for your rover that, which you use to measure the ground control points. Uh, and you can also log the raw data, your Rhinox file. So there's a lot of things you can do. It's really flexible. Uh, this is another interesting example from our customer where <laughs> it was really difficult to place the ground control point marker on the ground because there was no, no ground. Uh, so they had to place them on um, on posts. Um, and some other examples from, from our customers here, they were using it for uh, avalanche monitoring system. Uh, this is your typical drone mapping project with ground control point targets from Australia uh, for um, erosion monitoring project. Uh, and, you know, many, many more. Um, so another thing that makes it easy to get started is that we have a lot of YouTube videos. So if this is something that you are like, if this could be useful for you, then we have a lot of videos on how to get started, how to connect, how to actually do the ground control points, uh, which go in depth. And um, we also have a very good uh, community forum. It's over 6,000 users and they actively exchange their experiences about, you know, how to, how to use the equipment and how to, uh, how to make maps. Uh, the, we have a dedicated support team that is actually familiar with drone mapping and know how to can answer any questions about, uh, about the workflows. Uh, there is also a webinar coming from us uh, which will focus more on the ground control points workflow. So um, if you are interested to learn more, you can go to our website and in the on the bottom of the page, there is, uh, there is a place where you can enter your email and subscribe to updates. Now, there are different receivers that we offer. And uh, we often get a question, you know, what, like, which receiver should I choose? Um, so our Reach RS2 is the uh, high performance model. Uh, it is multi-band, so it receives multiple bands from, uh, from the same satellite, which allows it to be quicker and more robust in difficult conditions uh, in uh, maybe under some vegetation in a forest or in an urban area, uh, and it works faster. We also have a previous model, which is more, which is single band and it's kind of budgetary model. Uh, but if your work is in open conditions, um, uh, maybe like an open field, uh, rover is not far from a base, you know, you can work a little slower, then it's still a very good option to, uh, to save a budget. So, um, Now, like our receivers are available from our website. And uh, especially for this webinar, we're offering uh, a coupon code for the next five days where you can get a 5% off any of our receivers. Um, and a short word about, about Amlet. Um, we've been around for more than six years. We have dealers in over 40 countries and users from over 100 countries. And I think that about a third of our users are drone mappers. And uh, I think any expo where you know, there is some kind of, uh, there are exhibitors that do drone mapping, you'll find our receivers there either in drones or used as base stations or used for ground control points. Um, so at this point, uh, we feel like we become kind of the standard way of uh, getting uh, highly accurate uh, RDK georeference data for your drones. So just to sum it up, um, 
check out our website, subscribe to our to notification for the webinar, and don't forget to grab your discount. So thanks, thank you all for, for listening. And I think I made it in 15 minutes sharp. Thanks, thanks a lot, Igor. Yes, you did. Um, so we'll take questions at the end, but feel free to uh, post them on the chat um, if, if you have any questions uh, you, you, you might forget. Uh, next, we have Jack Behrens. Uh, Jack has been the uh, operation manager since uh, August 2019 of Hummingbird Technologies, a company that provides advanced crop analytics by pushing the boundaries of science and technology. Um, thank you, Jack, for, for joining us. And, uh, you have the floor. No problem. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, Igor, thanks for the presentation. We actually use MLID ourselves and um, yeah, we're big fans. Um, so I'm going to start with um, giving you a bit of background on Hummingbird. So we, we've been around since 2015. We're a data analytics company and we do offer remote sensing and, and machine learning solutions to farmers around the world. We basically look at four main problems for farmers that we, we want to resolve. Um, we want to protect yields and avoid yield loss, uh, which is a big problem. Um, we want to make practices more sustainable, make allow farmers to make more informed decisions um, with, with greater insights and, and perhaps even earlier decisions than they would otherwise have, have been able to make. And um, we want to make sure that inputs such as chemicals and water are more efficiently used. Yeah, so that's, that's basically a, a, a us. <laughs> um, we, with our process revolves around remote sensing and, and a, a large proportion of our customers use satellite data, but about 10% use drone data. Um, we've got our own drone fleet that we manage um, in across the across three continents, and we, for the other other geographies, we use uh, data collection partners. Um, in some circumstances, we actually use aircraft, uh, aircraft and, and sensors mounted on aircraft. We've got a cloud-based web application that we that the drone pilots can upload data to, and we aim for a four-hour turnaround um, after the data has been uploaded where the farmer can go into the application and, and use the services we provide. Um, one of the key, the key elements of our, our product is variable rate maps, which I'll, I'll get onto in a minute, but the farmer can, can use the, these variable rate application maps directly from our platform. So our, our products kind of fit into six different categories. So it's the optimizing inputs that I mentioned, which is the, the variable rate maps. Uh, we use it for herbicide, desiccants, um, growth regulators, and, and et cetera. Um, these are, this is more of a macro analytics, perhaps not as, as interesting to this, this audience because it's satellite based, um, as, as with the carbon dashboard and the yield pr prediction. But we, we also use macro analytics that is purely drones, and um, I'll go into that in more detail in the, in the next few slides. So this is a, a, a kind of broader look at all of our capabilities and the, cop, uh, the crops that we work on. Um, you can see down the side, this is the, the products that, that we have. And then these are whether it's from satellite or from drone. So all of our products are drone based aside from these yield prediction and crop type classification. Um, but there's also a satellite option as well. But obviously the, the drone is the preferred choice if the farmer wants higher resolution. Um, so I guess the, from looking at the We Robotics website, the key key geographies are more equatorial. Um, so I, I reckon they'll be looking at, at sugarcane and um, soybean, and perhaps a lot of uh, more of the the vegetables such as lettuce. So this is our uh, kind of our, our flagship. Um, sugarcane product, we call it gap detection. This uses a machine learning algorithm that, that works on drone data. So a farmer or a data collection partner will, will fly their crop 
and at about a two centimeter resolution on the on the RGB imagery and our computer algorithm will work out where the rows are and then it will work out where the crop is and it will map out where the gaps are in the crop. This is done at an early growth stage so the the farmer can go back in and, and replant areas that are underperforming. So you can see this area here is is predominantly red so the farmer may go back in to the field and um, get some crop in there before or some 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 drilling seeds in there before the um, surrounding crops gets too developed. It helps the, helps the farm to protect his yield and, and get more out of his land or her land. This is another product that, that we've been using quite a lot in the last year or so. Um, it, it, we call it knockdown, but it's a, it's a pre-emergence herbicide application. So if before a farmer has, has planted any seeds in his field or her field, then um, they, the farmer would like to look and, and see if there's any, any weeds that, that might be, become an issue. This has been very successful in Australia where the, the field size is a, a three, 400 hectares. Um, it, we fly this with a, with a, a multi-spectral camera at about a seven centimeter resolution. The weeds are detected and they, they look kind of like this. And then in our application map, uh, in our application, you can generate a variable rate map, which the farmer then, then does and can either download that as a shape file to, to put into the sprayer, or we have API links with a few big um, machinery manufacturers uh, in the agriculture sector, such as John Deere. Um, and yeah, this is this has been one of the, a favorite for a lot of farmers around the world. This kind of is the economic analysis for, for such an application. So if you look at these are all the prices in US, US dollars. Um, if you look at the, the herbicide cost per, per hectare that the farmer would be looking at, um, and then considering only about 50% of the farm needs to be sprayed because uh, if, if they don't use us, then they, they tend to use a flat rate weed application. But if you do variable rate weed application, it's far less of the, the land actually needs spraying. So the farmer's saving money on that, plus the our price per hectare, which um, is around three US dollars. Um, the farmer has significant savings across the field. And this is a herbicide application map um, for post-emergence so when the crop is crop is developed this this case studies on soybean in brazil so you can see here that the 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 software has identified areas where there's weed this the, the darker the color the more intense the weed is and um and then when we go and create the application map it has identified the areas that need spraying so in a in an original situation where the farmer would apply a flat rate and spray the entire field, we're only spraying these small blue sections and the farmer will get an, a similar output to how they would have before, but they will have saved their money by not paying for all this, all the chemicals. It's better for the environment and it's better for the farmer. And another economic analysis, which is, um, it shows the clear the clear return on investment for for such a product for the farmer. A lot of the questions we we get asked is um, do the farmers need specific equipment? Um, and yes, as long as the equipment is is fairly fairly new in the last 15, 20 years, then then it will it will work. But um, we, we have API links into a lot of big manufacturers. So we, we feel like we cover a large amount, a, a large portion of the, of the market and, and can service a lot, of, a lot of different machinery. So this is quite an exciting product that, that we've developed in the last two years. Um, it is one of the macro, the micro um, products that I was mentioning before. This, example is on lettuce and it's 
we're at the moment we we do summers in the UK and uh, Northern Europe, and then we do um, winter crops in in the U US and in the in Southern Europe. So essentially, what this is is we've developed a machine learning algorithm that will identify certain crops. So this example is lettuce, iceberg lettuce, I think, and it will identify each iceberg lettuce plant in the field and it will give it a grade and a size out of, um, so you can see here that the, the number associated to each, each uh, plant and it will give the farmer a, a very accurate, over 99% accuracy of the amount of plants he's got in, or she's got in the field and the size and the grade um, out of out of a hundred of of how good the plant is and how developed the plant is and and the size of it. This the the farmers tend to like this because it's it gets rid of a lot of manual counting and surveying that they tend to have to do, um, and we can get the data from from a quick drone flight over we we cover about seventy hectares in a day or eighty hectares in a day, and. Um, yeah, it helps the farmer with forecasting sales. And it, in the future, we're looking at, at merging this with nitrogen application to give the farmer a more uniform um, crop at the end of the season, the end of the growth. Um, that is That concludes my presentation. And if anyone has any questions, obviously ask them at the end. If you need to get in touch in the future, um, use any of these these contact details. We are at the moment we're we're looking to expand in a lot of different countries, and I'm personally setting up partnerships with different companies around the world. So if anyone has any any interest in partnering or or has any um, experience in the agricultural sector, please do get in touch, and and we can have a, a separate conversation. Thank you very much. Back to you, Joseph. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jack. Great great presentation. Um, now we have Hugo de Blau, uh, who is the founder and CEO of InFlight, a uh, company measuring the world in 3D, uh, one drone flight at a time. Hugo is, pa is, a, is also a passionate drone pilot, an aerospace engineer, and a McKinsey alum. So, Hugo, uh, you're next. I think you're on mute. All right, can you hear me now? All good. All good, yeah. All this technology, and then we just don't find the unmute button or the present slides. Can, can everybody see my uh, slides? Is it all good? All right, so thanks, uh, Joseph and uh, Claudina, for setting this up. My name is uh, Hugo de Blaue. I'm a founder and CEO of InFlights. Um, we uh, focus as a, the end result for our clients is uh, actually the measuring and the surveying of, um, of uh, our, as our end product. And we have experienced that uh, in the uh, drone world, there's a lot of companies like Hummingbird, but also other uh, companies that are similar uh, that have been investing a lot of money and time in uh, doing the analytics. They typically also combine many different uh, data sources to get to a product. They're like uh, I think Hummingbird is a great example. It's a combination of data from drones and satellites. And we have identified the operational issues of uh, running a drone network on a global level and ensuring that this happens uh, smoothly. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, as I said, the end product is uh, drone mapping, and we do this uh, globally for uh, larger clients that are actually looking to uh, survey at the global scale, but still have a very consistent uh, output of what is what are actually the deliverables. We also use, of course, the MLIT very actively, or at least our pilots uh, use it. We also use some other uh, <laughs> equipment, depending on what is available. Um, what I would like to talk, uh, I made a small presentation, special, especially for this uh, webinar. So what I wanted to talk about that we have seen uh, a lot of challenges that uh, local pilots or that pilots actually tend to experience is, um, is that um, 
life as a drone pilot sometimes can be uh, challenging. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm also an aerospace engineer. I also a pilot. I did uh, design uh, drones a long time ago. It's, I think it's, a, it's an incredible uh, technology. A lot of people uh, have jumped on, on this uh, technology, but when you look at the economics of uh, a drone pilot, you can see that um, some of them are doing getting some good gigs, but some of them are not. And there's actually quite a large crowd of uh, drone pilots. Um, and uh, it's, for me, this is a very fascinating, has always been a very fascinating uh, idea, you know, is that you have a lot of drone pilots all over the world that are emerging. They're all buying new types of equipment from companies like Emblet or DJI, of course, or other uh, providers that uh, give a lot of drones. And this gives a really very interesting opportunity is that you can actually, we can now go to clients as in-flights and tell them, look, we will take care of your survey needs on a global level because, hey, there's actually drone pilots all over the world. Yeah? And um, what we then see with our drone pilots is that they sometimes they struggle on a couple of elements. And I actually put uh, some of them here uh, together. I don't think the list is exhaustive, but I think that it, it probably captures a bit uh, what is going on. I think that when I look at the typical drone pilot we engage with, for them, the sales part is pretty hard. They tend to be more tech-based people, very enthusiastic about uh, their products. They do uh, good work. They will go, uh, I mean, before the rain or after the rain, they will wait for the clouds or they will wait for the clouds to be uh, gone, etc. But then when they get home, they typically don't really have the, a lot of time to spend on sales. Um, they uh, also uh, don't have a lot of time to start negotiating a lot of quotes. Yeah? And what I think is interesting in the drone world is that you, if you look at the price of a typical mission, which can be a couple of hundred euros, sometimes a couple of thousand, those are already the good missions, but typically it can be a couple of hundred euros. There's a lot of time lost in negotiating the prices with clients. And then actually what also happens at the side of the clients, they're not always very sure on what to expect. Uh, and this goes from more easier uh, jobs like serving, but it also goes to more complex jobs like uh, precision agriculture, where I think Hummingbird is doing a really great job, but also any other uh, end product where actually the needs, especially when that they uh, buy them, they, there is a new uh, drone that comes out, they buy it, and there's the RTK uh, elements that come, then there is uh, this new equipment, and after two or three years, actually, they realize some of their equipment is, is getting old, and so uh, that's a real challenge uh, for them, and it's always, it's not always so easy for a drone pilot to know or to understand okay what are actually do i need to buy the new dji drone or should i just stick with my current equipment and uh, just do an upgrade etc and then finally we see that when you look at the drone industry and and um it has evolved and i, I mean i've been designing control systems a long time ago when i was in the usa and uh, and i've seen so many applications popping up that you can do with the drone um, and, but there is none of them that is really a big application. Some of them are, but if you, at the end of the day, the drone industry is a very big industry, but it's really a sum of a lot of different niches. Yeah. One of them can be agriculture, but it can be surveying, but it can be mining. And even if you go inside every industry, you will see that the specific very use case are very, very niche. You know? And yes, that altogether is a very big, uh, uh, world world, but it's. It's still niche. So as a drone pilot, actually learning of all these niches and all the things you can do with your drone uh, from surveying to actually maybe even just taking very simple pictures is also very uh, challenging uh, to evolve. Um, I will let you comment on this uh, afterwards when we have the, uh, uh, the question. So um, what we do as in-flights, and I think that we are trying to solve uh, this problem um, uh, with the following uh, model and is that we coordinate a global partnership with many drone pilots to generate 3D CAD models. Um, and what happens here is that a client can go to our uh, website 
and order uh, a 3D mapping uh, um, um, area. Um, with our, uh, we will actually automatically, uh, with, our pro uh, with our processes, we will look if that area has actually any um, uh, regulatory issues. Um, by the way, I didn't mention, but of course regulations and the prices that are related to it is also a big challenge for our, our pilots. So hence, we will check what is actually the regulatory situation. And we will keep track. We will. We have actually a database of all our pilots, and we know who can fly where. Yeah. So that means that when we actually get a, a mission for a certain location, we immediately know who is the pilot with the right equipment, and who is actually the pilot that is legal to fly there. Because not everybody has licenses to fly everywhere, and not everybody wants to invest in that. So we keep track of that, and then finally we will dispatch this mission to uh, the right uh, drone pilot. Uh, and we will make sure that how he has to go there and what he needs to do is extremely clear. Yeah? What is also important that we do uh, is that we uh, will upfront have already negotiated all the prices with our pilots. And every pilot that signs up into our uh, platform can actually say, hey, I have, these are the drones I have, and this is how much I want to earn on a, for each drone. This is how much I want to uh, uh, earn or how much I want to be covered for uh, asking the permits. And this is how much I want to be covered on the per kilometer basis to actually go to the certain, uh, to that location. Okay. Then the pilot will go to the, the, the flight. He actually uploads the data and we will then take care of the processing and de delivering the insights to our clients. Um, how does it look like for a client? He can actually, I mean, I, I think I mentioned it before, but he can go to our web platform where he will insert uh, the area that he wants to be mapped. He can uh, also upload the KML. Instantly, we will actually get back to the client. Um, like, okay, actually we are able to fly or uh, we are not able to fly. That also is possible. I think here managing the expectations is always very important uh, because it's, it's just easier to say upfront, hey, we really cannot fly in a forbidden area than to spend a lot of time looking for a pilot and then realizing actually it's a it's an area where uh, it's illegal to fly anyhow, um, and the client can actually then finalize the quote. He or she will be informed on what is actually going on. And I think here uh, we have realized that in the industry people really want to be, follow up on what is actually uh, going on in terms of their um, uh, process. Uh, the process on getting there is very important. I mean, are we finding the pilot? Is are the things authorized? And when is actually the flight taking uh, place? And then uh, our clients they can they can access and download the uh, data uh, that we generate once uh, the uh, drone flight has taken place. Um, okay. The way we work allows us to have a very wide range of drones and equipment, and hence we are able to always accommodate. The, the request of our client in the right way. And that we can work Okay. So what is my question to you? We're trying to fill up this map. And uh, uh, do you want actually uh, to be a part of this? Um, the, we are really aiming for a, a niche of, of helping global clients to have a global uh, footprint. Uh, many of our clients are active in many parts in the world and they do experience uh, issues in finding the right pilots and finding the right uh, people to do their uh, 3D mapping. Uh, and hence we are uh, definitely always constantly looking to expand uh, this map. Uh, and uh, yeah, why would you join as a drone pilot? It's, it's uh, free to register. Um, I think that what we, the way we have thought about the model is that, uh, and if you look at the day of a pilot in in flights, it, you receive flight proposals that you know are uh, a good price because the prices are agreed up front. The only thing you actually need to look at is, okay, am I available? And what is the weather saying? And then you can accept that mission. So our, our goal is really to have pilots flying more and spending less time doing admin or uh, finding uh, their own uh, or, or, or negotiating on prices. Um, 
we have done the flight planning on the airspaces up front. So we have integrated with uh, uh, regulatory airspace data. So the, that job is already done. So that's quite a lot of time that is uh, saved. We make sure that you don't have, you have to don't have to drive that much because we will always allocate emissions that are close to your uh, location. Uh, as I said before, the prices are uh, agreed up front. And I think one of the last ones that I am uh, realizing that is getting more and more important is we do have a, a really a very vast amount of experience in photogrammetry, also uh, a lot of experience with uh, uh, issues that can uh, happen along the way with uh, the, the RTK rover or with this different drones. And we consider our uh, drone pilots not really suppliers, but really it's a drone partnership where we will uh, be ready to troubleshoot with our pilots if something goes wrong uh, on the field. Yeah? And uh, more and more, we are realizing that this sixth bullet point on the slide is actually becoming a, a very important one to, uh, to uh, help our pilots to also learn. Uh, but also, I think uh, uh, the reason we do this, I mean, it's, it's, it's that we have a promise to, to, to our, towards our clients. So hence, we also want to be uh, uh, really on top of the things or that are going on. Yeah. Uh, ourselves, we have a lot of experience with flying. Uh, uh, a lot of the people on the team are uh, drone pilots themselves or also pilots. Uh, so we do, we really do understand that uh, just, uh, I mean, things can go wrong on the field, but of course we want to make sure that we can uh, address those issues as soon as we can. All right. Um, what is actually the process on, on how it goes? I mean, you can register. Uh, here you need to enter uh, just all the drones you have and uh, what certificates do you have? So what are the countries where you can fly and what are the airspaces you can fly in? Um, you need to determine what is your rate to, to fly for them. We do apply uh, so a kilometer rate and on the equipment it's a minimum base and then it's a per hectare uh, rate that gets added uh, to that. Um, then once that is there you will receive uh, propo flight proposals from uh, our clients. They can come from all over the world but they will be close to your mission but the clients will be international and uh, this Proposal should perfectly match actually your expectations, the agreement we have up front. Um, then you can fly the missions. We make sure that everything is super clear on what is expected from us. So there's, there shouldn't be any uh, 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 problems on uh, the expectations. And of course, we stand by to, to support uh, our pilots in case something goes wrong. Uh, once the flight is done, you can upload the data to a platform. Uh, my CTO just told me to tell you all it, we have a very fast upload. <laughs> Not sure how important that is, but at least uh, we work with Amazon uh, and it's definitely a very good robust upload. And then we take care of the processing. And once the processing is done and you everything is uh, ready, you will receive an email and on how you can actually uh, send your invoice and of course get paid uh, for that. Um, all right. So you can sign up at inflight.com slash pilot or just uh, shoot us an email at the pilots at inflights.com. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Hugo. So thanks everyone. Uh, we're gonna now take questions. So um, in the interest of time, if you could post your questions in the chat, we already have a few questions lined up. So I'll, I'll ask them for you, but you can add, add them and uh, you know specify uh, who you uh, or which company uh, your question is, is for. Um, so let's start uh, with you, uh, Hugo, because you just yes. you finished your presentation. Um, I, uh, I have a question is, um, how much do you know about the client before you uh, basically uh, put, uh, put this request on the platform? Do you have a series of questions? Uh, for us you, or? Uh, for, for you and for the pilot. Yes, yeah, so from us, it will be uh, always uh, industrial clients or uh, corporate clients that we have developed uh, very good relationships with. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, they will, um, yeah, so that's, that's how we manage that. And towards our pilots, we will, uh, everything will be super clear on uh, for the exact location and how to get to that location or to have access or to ensure everything can happen uh, correctly. Yeah. Uh, and Quite often, we will also take care. If if needed, we will take take care of the paperwork on uh, yeah giving 
authority to that specific pilot to fly at a certain location if that's needed. But that depends on a country per country and uh, mission per mission uh, basis. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, question for for uh, Jack. Um, what what sensor and drones work best with uh, with your current platform? Uh, do you have any recommended uh, systems? Or? So we uh, we've got a long list of, of sensors and drones that, that or just sensors that we can accept. Um, most of our UAV UAV products are based off of RGB sensors, but we also accept the MicroSense, all the red edges and the the Altum as well as the Sequoia. Um, we're looking to, to get more multi-spectral cameras onboarded soon. But yeah, the, the most of the drones tend to be, um, in it, they vary per geography. In Europe, there are a lot of uh, multi-rotor stuff, but in, in Brazil and, and Australia, we tend to go for more fixed wing to cover more area, like the EB. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, Igor, a uh, question for you. So it's a combination of questions. Um, um, so what's your um, distribution network? Uh, you know, uh, where in, in the world do you, do you distribute the, those, those GPSs? And how, um, you know, the, I think your price is groundbreaking compared to the existing solution. So how did you make it uh, so affordable? Um, so our distribution network is over 40 countries. So we have delivers in more than 40 countries and we also ship worldwide from, uh, from our online store. And, uh, yeah, we have, we have really formed a great network of, uh, you know, really good partners that can support the client and, uh, um, yeah. Um, so it's one of our goals initially was not just to make the equipment affordable and easy to use, but also make it uh, accessible in terms of that it's easy to get it, easy to buy it, and we keep working on that. And then the other thing is that our price is always upfront. I'll be direct or with a dealer, you always know the price you're paying, which is very unusual from the industry. It's usually, you know, call for a quote and you have to actually talk to a person and go through the sales process. Um, in terms of making it more efficient, well, it's, um, I think, you know, the technology was there. It's just that there was no, uh, no motivation for the big players to change anything and to kind of, um, you know, there is basically they have no interest in, in making it more affordable and we were, we were able to do it. And, you know, we invested a lot of just a lot of time, efforts, R&D development into that. And that's, that's how it works. There is, uh, there is no secret, <laughs> secret to that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, another question for Hugo. Um, what's your, uh, if you can talk a little bit about your quality uh, assurance process, you know, once you or maybe before you send the request to a pilot and after, how do you, you know, make sure that the data is up to uh, standards that the client wants? Yes, so uh, there's many steps that we do to ensure our, our pilot uh, network is actually qualitative. I think it's also important to note that we are uh, not looking, uh, it was on my slide, but I kind of went maybe to kick over it. We're not looking to get a very high number of pilots. We're actually more looking to get a very high number of square kilometers that we cover with good pilots. Uh, because we do know that uh, uh, the quality of how things are being flown is very important. And we do, and this does really keeps us awake is on how we, uh, I mean, how our pilots flying. We're quite specific and a bit autistic on, on, on the settings on, on how we need to fly. And this doesn't always get followed. So we, we do uh, do a, a, a like uh, before actually a pilot gets on board and we do, there is a first mission, we will do an onboarding call uh, to just explain how we want things to, to happen. Um, and uh, sometimes we also will require pilots to send some sample data of previous missions. And then we will already see, okay, I mean, uh, there is a motion blur or there's some element that we would like to avoid uh, in the future. Uh, and then after the flight, we will, uh, we have our own, yeah, quality checks 
to make sure that the data is uh, correctly uh, flown, that the RPK precision is uh, good, uh, that the GCPs are measured correctly. So we will also ask like, if there's GCPs that are being measured, we will also want to have the raw data to make sure if there was always a fix, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have a, a, a quite extensive uh, quality assurance process to, to ensure everything is done uh, correctly. I think that the um, where we are jumping on on the niche is that um, there is definitely a very uh, big need for surveying uh, globally. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are really struggling to actually get quality surveying uh, because there is just a lot of people flying with drones uh, that uh, don't do always the quality assurance. So that's a bit where added value comes in. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Jack, a question for you about um, how the model was trained and whether you sample data from um, maybe less sampled areas like Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, each, each model is trained slightly differently. Um, okay. the, the lattice one, for example, is, is we, you can get quite a good representation from just a few fields um, because there's so many lattices in, in each field. They, the difficult bit is, is telling the computer what a lettuce looks like. So we have to go through and, and you manually draw, draw around each, each lettuce in a small section, and then you expand that section and you, you see how the model is working on a larger area. And then you, you can ex draw around the, all the lettuces and, and cor make corrections and make corrections and make corrections. And then each iteration makes the, the model slightly more accurate. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've, we've, we've got a partner in Malawi who's flying a lot of sugarcane. Um, we've got a partner in South Africa that is, is looking to get up and running soon. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking to different people in, in different countries, countries such as Kenya and, and Nigeria. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an area that I'd like to develop in the next, the next few months or years. Great. I think we uh, we should have a side conversation about this. And cool. <laughs> yeah. Igor, question question for you um, about the uh, Navio two, uh, and I think a related question is is uh, does your technology integrate with RTK drones? If I'm not mistaken. Um. So. So the Navio 2 is a kind of different product that we have. This is what we actually started with. It's more like an educational uh, platform so that people can learn to program drones. It's based on the Raspberry Pi. It's an extension, actually, like a hat. So uh, a board that attaches on top of Raspberry Pi, and we provide like examples in Python and C++, and you can run Artpilot and all sorts of things, experiment. Um, so, and then there is a bunch of projects I see uh, mention of the, like an RC blimp and people have done like, you know, virtually any kind of autonomous thing with Navio 2. Uh, and it's, it's a really cool board. I like it. It's really stable. It's been around for years and there are tons of universities that just use it as, um, um, as like teaching material, something that they give to the students to try and build something. Um, so that's the, the Navio 2. And uh, um, the other question was? The, uh, um, does um, basically some of your product integrate yeah. with uh, RTK GPS, uh, RTK drones? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so we also have our own offering of, uh, so we have the Reach M2, Reach M Plus. These are tiny modules that you can install on your drone, provided you have a camera with hot shoe. And then we take care of everything. You can, you can do a, like a PPK survey like with only Amlet products and, you know, if you have a Sony camera on your drone. Uh, we also integrate with SenseFly, so you can use it as SenseFly for EBRTK. We have um, documentation published on that. Uh, so it integrates directly with the Emotion software. And uh, we also recently tested it with, uh, <clears throat> with the Phantom for RTK. Uh, and together with our Caster product, it could be used as a, as a base for for Phantom, uh, for for Phantom for RTK, both in RTK and PPK mode, uh, and then yeah, virtually any drone that can accept RTCM three data, which is the industry standard for real time corrections, uh, as we output that, 
or you know any drone that produces a Rhinox file, which is the standard for re like log draw data. Uh, we could take that from the drone. We could take our data, and then this could be processed for um, to get the precise uh, coordinates of pictures. Um, so yeah, we can we can do like virtually anything RDKPP related. <laughs> very cool. Very very cool. Um, so we are reaching the end of the hour, um, and I think uh, if you want to ask more questions to our speakers, uh, I will put up the, their contact information on the website. I will post this recording, so you can directly reach out to them, um, and and you know find out more, or discuss more, partner with them. Um, we uh, we robotics on behalf of we robotics. I wanted to thank you for you know joining and presenting. Um, you know, Igor, Jack, and Hugo. Uh, we're very excited to have you on this first uh, session. And for the audience, please give us, you know, feedback about what you like and don't like, uh, so that we, uh, or who you, you'd like to see for the next session, and, and then we will uh, incorporate your comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Great. All right. Have a have a great day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Bye bye. 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 Thanks.